could a genuine democracy in the European Union ever be achieved uh, whilst retaining a significant degree of uh, national sovereignty and uh, hopefully a free trade area as well? Is that to bo either or both? Either or both. Okay. Well, <laughs> you get it, okay. Um, no, I don't think you can have a genuine democracy because uh, remember what you need to, in order to establish democracy. I mean, democracy is demos and kratos. So the power, okay, fine. The kratos is with the European Union, but there is no demos. And what you need in order to establish and constitute a demos is something else. What you need is, uh, for example, a common public opinion. No, you don't have that in Europe because you have different languages and most people do not really follow what's happening in other countries. They don't read foreign newspapers. They don't really follow in detail what's happening in Portugal or France. So there is no common opinion, uh, common European opinion. And um, interest in pan-European affairs, ex with the exception of the Euro crisis, has always been quite low. Nobody really follows what's going on um, with the Commission in Brussels or what's happening in the European Parliament. So I think in the foreseeable future, I do not see a chance of creating a European people that would actually justify speaking of a European democracy. So I think in many ways, it would be desirable to just wind back the clock, go back to where the European community was um, in the 1990s, where it was good actually, of establishing a free trade framework, a common market, um, guarantee the four freedoms of uh, free movement of capital, people, um, labor, um, services, goods, establish all of that, but refrain from trying to be something else. The European Union isn't a nation state, it will never be a nation state, it should be a framework of enabling trade between friendly European nations. I think that's what it sh should aim to aspire. Okay, I'm beginning to see, I mean, there are slight differences between myself and Oliver. I think we do, I still think we agree on 95% of things, but maybe you know, we can discuss some of these things a bit, because I think in Europe, as opposed to the European Union, I think theoretically you could have a pan-European democracy, uh, but the, the precondition for it would be getting rid of the European Union, because the European Union, I, I agree with Oliver on this point, there is no demos. It's not a, it's not a result of a popular democratic movement. It's a completely uh, top-down technocratic institution, uh, which is not... Uh, accountable to ordinary people. So I if you thought that a pan-European democracy was desirable, uh, then you'd have to get rid of the European Union and then you'd have to uh, ha have a popular drive to create that kind of pan-European democracy. Now, Oliver might argue, he may, may be right, that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but th that would be the only way I would say you can achieve it. Uh, yeah, I think where, where there's a slight difference, it's much more that, Oliver, if I under understood you correctly, you seem to be arguing that the problem was the European Union was a cover for real national interests. Whereas I would say that at least since the early 90s, it's much more been that democratically elected politicians have almost like handed over power and ha abdicated responsibility to lead and given it to these faceless bureaucrats in Brussels. And they, they like all of these kind of rules, fiscal rules, which as it happens don't even work. But the reason they like them is because they don't have to, they being the democratic politicians, don't even have to exercise discretion because they can say, there's this rule you've got to follow, there's that rule you've got to follow. And that's a way of evading making political judgment. Want to respond to that? Well, I don't quite agree with that because I do not really think that Brussels really runs the show. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they chose someone like Hamel van Rompuy to be the first president of Europe. They didn't take... Um, a famous European politician, they took a former Belgian prime minister. And the reason was that they didn't want anyone to rival, um, for example, Chancellor Merkel or President Sarkozy, so they wanted to install a weak figure to make sure that Brussels doesn't run the show and that national interests in the end still dominate what's being decided in Europe. And it's a well-known practice, of course, that if you've got something that you can't just legislate for on the national level because it's way too unpopular, you just give it to Brussels and wait until it comes back to you as a directive. <laughs> so it's really national interests at play, and I think the European Union is a giant cover-up for national interests. Okay. Over here. Uh, yeah, I have a question specifically for Oliver. Um, you, you touched upon the thing, you know, you said Angela Mer for Angela Merkel, um, the European Union is better of war, you know, war on peace, etc. Uh, we've all seen the nasty images recently of, you know, uh, Greek protesters burning a German flag, um, 
images of Angela Merkel dressed in a Nazi uniform in the Greek papers. How troubling are d these sentiments for you, um, like among the Greek? Do you think that's something, oh, you know, it's just part of the protest, that'll go? Or is that something that will really take hold and maybe get even worse? That is something that troubles me, but for different reasons, and it probably troubles Angela Merkel. Now, Angela Merkel um, believes that she has to pursue her policies in order to prevent uh, war later on, when I actually think that her policies are driving us to that point where there is growing uh, resentment towards Germany. Um, it's not just Greece, by the way. I mean, the Germans and the Irish were traditionally extremely friendly. And uh, I mean, two embarrassing points that the um, Irish actually lit up their cities in the Second World War to guide the bombers to England. <laughs> um, but be that as it may, um, they were extremely friendly. Historically, they were not, there was never any bad blood between the two countries. It took the Euro crisis and the impression that the Irish got that now the Germans are running the show and they sent their um, officials to the uh, Irish Treasury to tell them what to do to create some sense of hostility towards Germany. So I think this whole policy of trying to save or rescue or keep alive the Euro project is actually uh, undermining the whole achievement of the European Union of creating a community of um, peoples, of friendly peoples. So I think Angela Merkel's got it completely wrong. What she's trying to do in order to uh, secure perpetual peace is actually driving Europe exactly in the other direction. Comment on that one? Well, on, on that point, I completely agree with Oliver because all of the kind of rhetoric about the European Union was, uh, you know, it'll bring Europeans closer together, they'll have more kind of fellow feeling, and it's done the exact opposite. It's just created huge resentment between the people of Europe. You cannot think of an institution more divisive among Europeans than the European Union and the Eurozone. It's completely divided the continent. It's a real tragedy. When I was a student, I had a little bit of first-hand experience about the cultural differences between the British and the Europeans, because I had an older brother who had a string of French and Italian girlfriends. <laughs> and uh, when he jilted them, they used to ring me up and complain about him. Um, anyway, I have a question for Daniel. Daniel, uh, you talk about the... Um, the uh, productivity uh, as being the, the, the major economic problem confronting the European Union. Um, how can you see a way through that to resolve the crisis, or can't you? Well, I don't see a way of resolving the crisis within the structure of the Eurozone. I mean, clearly, Greece and Portugal and the other less productive countries have a challenge of making their economies more productive. I'm sure that's what they want to do, and that would be a good thing to do. Uh, but the Eurozone just makes it harder for them to do that. So, for example, it, Greece doesn't have the option of uh, devaluing its currency uh, as a way of responding to the economic problems it faces. It doesn't have the option of changing interest rates in the way that it would like. All the kind of short-term policy adjustment measures it's not free to make. Uh, so I think if it left the Eurozone, Greece would be, or Spain, whoever, would be in a much better position to develop. Because they do need to become more productive. It's just that the Eurozone makes it more difficult for them to achieve that. So, so what you're saying is that this, situa this um, uh, problem with differential in productivity can only be resolved by Greece leaving the Euro. Or the alternative is a very undemocratic kind of union, which is what, in fact, is, is the direction that things are going, where the, uh, you have a kind of fiscal union imposed on Europe and fiscal transfers, so money moving, say, from Germany to Greece or, or wherever, uh, without the permission or, of the people, without consulting the you know, democratic constituents of Europe. So you do it in a completely undemocratic, authoritarian kind of way. And unfortunately, that, that is the way, that's the direction in which things are heading, I think. I think we're already there. We are already <laughs> in the transfer union. And uh, the problem is actually, I agree, um, it would be desirable to wind back the whole experiment and introduce national currencies, or at least to split the euro in two. The problem is actually that we have now come to the point after two years, well, more than two years of the euro crisis, where there are su such um, enormous sums at play that no country can really realistically afford that anymore. Um, the little known problem um, of um, target two balances, now that takes too long to explain, but basically it means, if I sum it up, if Greece leaves the euro, um, that means other countries are sitting on 100 billion euros they can't recover. 
because that's what uh, the Greek Central Bank basically owes to the European Central Bank and thereby to other central banks. But if Germany, for example, decided to leave the Eurozone, and I would support that in principle because I think that would help everybody else, but uh, it would leave Germany with a balance of 547 billion euros that they couldn't recover. And that's currently in the German Central Bank and the Bundesbank on their balance sheet is about two thirds of their balance sheet. And the Bundesbank, unfortunately, is also now in a position of being a net debtor to the German banking system. So the moment that Germany says we're pulling out, uh, they're wrecking their own central bank, they're probably wrecking their banking system, and the German taxpayer is simply not strong enough to recapitalize them, so they're locked in. So even though it makes sense to pull them out, they can't afford it. So the whole thing is dragging on, and we're probably seeing a much bigger disaster further down the track. Yeah. Any good news, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, in the early days of the EU, I got the impression it was a bit of a love-in, and uh, I often heard uh, comments along the lines that it provided an alternative to the United States. It was um, economically as big or almost almost as big and it was a nicer kind of society and not like that evil capitalist um, America, especially during the Ronald Reagan era. Um, to what extent do you think that was a factor in, um, in the EU's motivation and formation? So are you talking about the e EU... I mean, as the EU really, I'm arguing, was created in the early 90s. Yeah. But it sounds like you're talking about the, the early historical period. No, um, I'm, I'm thinking, I suppose, that they thought they had, they had something um, pretty clever and, and they built on it and the euro, I guess, was a, a consequence of building on it because they, they really thought they had it all figured out. Um, the, I guess my point is that Oliver has said that it was driven by European national in interests uh, I'm, all I'm questioning is whether there was also a significant factor of we can be bigger than America yeah. and do it better than America also driving it. But I, I would see that more as a 1980s kind of discussion where uh, there was a debate about in the early 80s of eurosclerosis, w which w was saying that you know, the, the European economy is not growing fast enough and Asia's rising and we need to... Uh, be strong relative to America. So I think at that point that was an important motivation to try to create some kind of European bloc that would uh, be able to compete with Asia on the one hand, which then was just beginning to rise, and America uh, on the other hand. Uh, although European politicians are quite pragmatic in the sense that when it suits them to be individual countries, they'll be individual countries. And when it suits them to say, yeah, we're whatever it is, 500 million people, you know, we're bigger than America, our economy is bigger than America. They'll kind of, that'll, they'll do that as well. So they'll try and play it both ways. Uh, but I, I think that's more of a debate, from my perspective, of the 70s and 80s. And now, there's, although there's a bit of that still going on, there's a slightly different dynamic that's really at work. I think that uh, spirit is still quite um, alive um, in Europe. I remember that, uh, for example, in Germany's uh, reform years earlier in the century, there was a big discussion in Germany whether they should really aspire to have something like American circumstances, Amerikanische Verhältnisse, that's what they call it. And what they meant is they didn't want to have that turbo-capitalist society, this neoliberal experiment, and they rather wanted to be as they were in that um, Rhineish uh, capitalist model um, with a big welfare state. I actually believe that the spirit is still um, alive in Europe today, and um, there is still a sense of European exceptionalism that they had created some kind of enlightened economy, a third way, and I mean, you just have to listen to European politicians when they're traveling around the world and lecturing the rest of the world how to run things, even though everybody can clearly see in what state Europe is. So I think there is still this idea. And uh, I mean, even in some Americans actually um, believed it at the time. There were books published only 10 years ago that predicted um, the 21st century is going to be the European century because they were so enlightened and they moved beyond the old capitalist model and so on. I think uh, it's time for the Europeans to realize that there is a world outside Europe and have a closer look. Okay. Over here. Um, I have two interrelated questions for both gentlemen. One is, um, what is the role that the monarchists and the monarchies are playing in this EU debate? Because I, under I understand, I might be wrong, but I understood that um, the late Otto von Habsburg, for instance, was involved at some points in European Unionization, and also what role does religion play because Europe has 
but it's got a very quickly growing um, Muslim population and it's a centre point for a number of other world religions. So, yeah, yeah. wondering that was something different. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I've not come across this question before. Uh, I think, I don't, don't, in terms of monarchy, certainly the British monarchy, I don't see it playing a... It seems to be interested in other things rather than talking about the European Union. Uh, there certainly is an obsession in Europe about, certainly in certain sectors about Islam, probably a bit less in Britain, to a certain extent in Britain, but in, uh, in Germany, in France, in Switzerland, which is not a member of the European Union, complete fear about the Islamic population. But to me, that actually says much less about Islam than it does about the lack of security among mainstream <coughs> Europeans about their own identity. Because if you're really self-confident about your own identity and you know, what you stand for and who you are, uh, you don't get het up about the fact that there are a few million Muslims living in your country. It's not really a big deal. And they're not, the Muslims are not some kind of coherent political bloc in any, way, in any case. I mean, they come from different countries, have different cultures and so on. Uh, I think it says much more about the... Uh, yeah, the lack of confidence within the European elites rather than it says anything about the, uh, the, uh, the Muslims. I think you do, just to finish on this, you do have almost a kind of new monarchy of these Eurocrats who Oliver mentioned. My, my favourite is Car Catherine Ashton. Now, you, you might not have heard of Catherine Ashton. Hardly anyone in Britain has heard of Catherine Ashton. As far as I remember, she's not been elected by anyone at all, although she did win Channel 4... Eurocrat of the Year Award or something like that from some television station. Or, uh, but she, she, as far as I remember, she, she's not won any major political election. She was a member of Britain's House of Lords, so she was appointed uh, to that position. Uh, and now she's the head of the uh, European Union's foreign policy. She's effectively the EU's foreign minister. So this complete non-entity, completely unelected, she's going around to the Middle East and other places lecturing them about the merits of democracy. I mean, the temerity of this woman, and I'm picking on her, there are other Eurocrats besides her, but she's an incredible example of what's going on. The temerity of this unelected non-entity, no one in her own country has ever heard of, going and lecturing the Libyans or the Syrians or whoever on democracy, she has absolutely no moral authority to do it whatsoever, but that is how the European Union works. It's just a completely top-down, undemocratic, technocratic institution. That's why they chose her as foreign minister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, of course, yeah, I'm of course a staunch monarchist. Um, after all, the royal family is German. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on your question, Otto von Habsburg, uh, he, of course, uh, died last year. He was a member of the European Parliament for some time. He was a member of the Christian Social Union, so the Bavarian Christian Democrats, basically. Um, he was also quite a committed uh, classical liberal, as far as I understand. Uh, and I don't really believe he had any wish to reintroduce monarchy across Europe. And frankly, I don't really see any um, particular drive in any European country to reintroduce monarchy. I think not even Nicolas Sarkozy would like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, just, if you look at the uh, German declared position of fear of inflation and Angela or Angela, is it Angela or Angela? Angela. An Angela. Angela. Merkel. <laughs> okay. And the Bundesbank said that with the history of the Weimar Republic and all the hyperinflation that they would never do any quantitative easing. The LTRO, from what I understand, is absolutely quantitative easing mm. in another name. So mm. if you could talk to that and also the consequence of that, when you say Germany can't leave now because they can't afford it, is it now a race to the bottom? So if they can't leave, can Greece leave? Even if they work out that the rest of the EU is not trying to help them, mm. is there a point where they say, we don't want any more austerity and we're better off going back to the drachma? So is that possible or likely? And, or is it other countries that are bigger, a bigger risk? Thank possible, you. yes. Uh, likely, probably not for the next um, two weeks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what uh, Greece needs in order to be able to leave the Eurozone is a primary surplus, because as long as they're still in primary deficit, it's a bit of a problem to leave. Um, so, I mean, of course, they could always print money, but it would be easier for them if at least they had consolidated their budget to a position where they could just get by without ongoing support from other European countries. Uh, now, whether the Germans are going to leave or not um, for fear of inflation, at least they're getting a bit more nervous now. They're getting a bit more nervous after the LTRO operations with a trillion euros being given to European banks. And um, we heard some noises coming out of the Bundesbank. Of course, the Bundesbank had already 
uh, seen two resignations over the past uh, 16 months now with uh, first the Bundesbank president and the chief economist of the European Central Bank who came from the Bundesbank. Um, I think the Germans are currently realizing that this whole policy is le leading in into a very difficult position because uh, this four 547 billion euro uh, target two balance is actually even now overstretching the Bundesbank. There may come a point in the not too far future when the Bundesbank is forced to sell off gold reserves in order to take on extra uh, positions um, for Greece. So there is a limit to that operation and the Germans are getting a bit anxious about that. Far from that, it's a very interesting concept because the German Bundestag has so far given its um, approval to separate rescue measures for Greece twice. They also approved the other bailouts for Portugal and for Ireland. They also approved the EFSF, they approved the ESM. And yet, if you put all of that together, that's small beer, that's really small fry when you compare that to what the Bundesbank has already committed itself to. And so it is a tricky position. And Jens Weidmann, the Bundesbank president, is uh, getting very nervous. He sent a letter to Mario Draghi last week complaining about that. But I think they need to have a much stronger debate. There are some German economists, um, in particular Hans Werner Sinn of IFO in Munich, uh, leading the debate, but I think it's long overdue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, only to say that I don't think there is any easy way out. I, I'd really like to give an upbeat message to this audience. I'm really struggling and thinking, what can I say that's upbeat? Maybe Oliver will come up with something. But I, I think that, uh, yeah, well, yeah, if you come to emigrate to Australia, my, uh, for some people, will be a solution, I'm sure. In fact, well, a true anecdote. When I, I first arrived in uh, Australia, my uh, hair was a bit long, so I thought I'd have a haircut. And the person cutting my hair tend to, turned out to be someone from Ireland who'd kind of uh, escaped from... Uh, the Irish, in fact, his mother had kicked him out of the house and told him to go and get a job somewhere. So he'd come to Australia to get a job. So I'm sure that for some individual Europeans, they'll make their way to Australia and other places to escape. And that, for an individual, that's a solution if you're a young guy or a young woman. But there's no easy way out for Greece or Ireland as a country. I think getting out of the euro, staying in the euro, I would say get out. But neither is an easy option. They're both problematic. OK, now, look, we've got three remaining people standing, so we'll leave it at that. But please be quick, because we should finish within the next five to 10 minutes. So Rodney, the next. And then you're next over here. Yeah. Uh, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Italy are all trading while insolvent. There is no point in pursuing it. They should go into liquidation, and that's the end of it. Businesses that trade while insolvent gets, gets worse and worse and worse. Germany is also trading while insolvent. They have uh, admitted debts of nearly 100% of GDP. They've thrown money around all over the joint and prejudiced their pension commitments and all the rest of it. So as far as I can see, they're, they're all trading well and solvent and there's, there's no resolution except to just write off all the debt or hyperinflate, probably the latter. There's one other point I want to make which none of you have mentioned, is there is ever-increasing regulation. Go to set up a business anywhere here or in uh, Europe, you have to get through town planning permission, which you want to be young to start. Uh, if you put someone on, you're committed to keep them for six months. If they rob you, you've got to pay them for unfair dismissal. If they fall off something, you've got to compensate them. If you buy a new piece of equipment, it's got to have three knobs on it that nobody knows what they do, but are supposed to be related to safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The EU is a, a actually uh, in innovating new labour regulations all the time. There is no way out of this. It's just a ludicrous situation. <laughs> Maybe we should just leave it at that on that one. OK, over here. Well, that kind of ties in well in the sense that I was going to say it seems like there's no way out of this and, and uh, it seems like it's a mess. Um, so I have one, I think, quick question, which is I didn't quite understand why there's this such disparate productivity gap between North and South. And and putting that to one side then, what is the impact on the rest of Asia, US and so on if this mess carries on? Um, you asked us to challenge your thesis. It seems like everybody accepts your thesis. So what's, what's the outlook for Asia, which we're part of, and the US, et cetera? Okay, do you want to come back on those now? Yeah. Uh, I think, well, the European Union, if you measure it uh, at current exchange rates, so not taking into account so-called purchasing power parity, uh, in other words, not adjusting for uh, differences in the cost of living, but comparing real dollars to real dollars, uh, 
The European Union, I think, is still about 25% of global output. So it is an important part of the global economy. Uh, so if there's a real, if it really blows up in a big way, I think it will have an impact on the global economy. Uh, although, w when I began to look at it more closely, probably not quite as much as people think. I mean, a lot of Europeans were talking about the impact on China uh, because they would say that uh, China exports a lot of its exports to the European Union and therefore China will be hit and then therefore that will then have a, uh, an impact on the rest of the global economy. Uh, and they were talking almost as if ch the, uh, China had some kind of moral uh, obligation to give them money for that reason, which is a bit of a silly argument, I think. But I, for reasons to do with China, which is perhaps is for, for a different discussion, I don't think the impact is quite as great because I mean, what China does very briefly with its exports, it often it will import a lot of components. So if you take the, the iPad as an example, it might import components from all over the world, including from Germany and other places, assemble them in China and then export them to the European Union and other places. So although you might say a high proportion of uh, Europe's trade is with China or China's trade is with Europe, uh, in fact, if there's a problem in Europe, it's not just going to hit China. It'll hit China to a certain extent, but it's just that kind of value-added margin that is a key thing to look at. It will actually hit German companies as well, so producing bits for the iPhone and Korean companies and so on. So I think the impact of a Euro crisis is probably, on the rest of the world, is probably exaggerated, although there will be some impact. I mean, I read today that European banks are lending less to Australia, for example, because they're reining in their lending. So there is some kind of impact, but probably not as great as people assume. Yep. No, okay, Marshall, last question. Thank you. Um, could a question to both of you. Could you tell us the, amplify the story of the uh, failure of the fiscal rules? It seems to me that it wasn't a, um, it wasn't that Demos was missing, it was that Crassi was missing. That there was uh, in, the, in the structure no way of enforcing the rules. And, but is that what happened? That did they ever think they'd work? Thank you. Do I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the story behind the growth and stability pact, uh, sorry, the stability and growth pact, I always get that wrong. Um, the Germans were hesitant, as I explained earlier, um, uh, giving up the Deutsche Mark, which was always stable and uh, much trusted and actually much loved in Germany for this uh, new funny currency, the Euro. So in order to convince the Germans that they had nothing to fear, um, the European Union actually gave him some concessions. One of them was to locate the central bank in Frankfurt, so in close proximity to the old Bundesbank. Um, the other concession was to give them that commitment to um, fiscal stability, so that's the uh, stability part of the Stability and Growth Pact. The French then insisted that stability alone wasn't enough, and that's where the growth comes into the Growth Pact. And the rules were um, initially thought to be um, sufficient. I mean, deficits not exceeding 3%, total debt not exceeding 6%, 60%. Um, the problem was actually that before they even introduced the new currency, um, it was quite clear that nobody was playing by these rules because then it was interpreted. And the interpretation, for example, so said that um, it was then enough to have a country that's on the way to reaching 60%. Um, when, I mean, Belgium was at 110, but it was uh, clearly moving that way. So that was okay. Um, and the same for Italy, when everybody knew, of course, that Italy was nowhere near meeting the criteria. And then, of course, everybody also knew that everybody else was fiddling with their figures. So in the Italian case, they counted the black market as part of the economy, which reduced the deficit. <laughs> Fine. So, and then Goldman Sachs, from what we have now heard, uh, was complicit in um, dealing with um, the Greek figures in a creative way. So even before they introduced the currency, nobody really played by the rules of the pact. And then, of course, what happened uh, afterwards, well, <laughs> ironically, was Germany and France. Um, first in breach of the deficit rules in 2003 and 4, but um, then it became quite clear that the pact was insufficient in so far as it didn't quite specify what happens next. Yeah, okay, you're in breach, but now should we punish you? Should we actually uh, punish you and you have to pay a billion euro fee, which will actually uh, make the situation much worse, really, for you and for deficits? So once that was a precedent, uh, everybody else thought they had a license to do the same, and so this pact was basically killed. I would argue, 
However, that this pact from the beginning was not even sufficient in dealing with the whole situation because in the end, what you need is not just fiscal rules. And I think that's the same mistake the Europeans are now repeating once again with the fiscal compact. They are pretending that they're dealing with a debt crisis when in fact it isn't. Debt, and there I think we completely agree, is really just a symptom of a far bigger crisis. At its root, this crisis is a productivity crisis, a crisis of productivity differentials, and it is a crisis of, current, uh, of um, balance of payments differences between different countries. As long as you haven't tackled them, you can do about public debt and deficits, whatever you like, you will always have a problem. And I think that's where this giant 547 billion euro black hole comes from. It's got nothing to do with public deficits, but it's got everything to do with current, with, uh, current account deficits and the um, uh, differentials between different countries. So I think that has to be tackled. We have to actually find a solution where countries can actually regain their competitiveness and then everything else will fall into place. But really starting with fiscal deficits and saying this will solve our crisis, really putting the cart before the horse. Password? Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that and I won't try to repeat it, maybe just to highlight a few points. First of all, well, the very important point that it was France and Germany in, in 2002 that you know, breached the uh, stability and growth pact, the deficit 3% uh, deficit rule. So it's very easy now to heap derision on Greece, but you know, in that sense they didn't start it. Uh, and also now when they talk about the future and the kind of fiscal pact for the future uh, and how this will embody rules, they almost forget that they had rules in the past and they flouted those rules. Uh, and to me, I'm, I'm not a great fan of rules in that sense. You can have all sorts of arbitrary rules, and those rules can look very good on paper. Uh, but first of all, as Oliver said, and I completely agree, the, the, fundament, the question is a much more fundamental question of economic productivity uh, and working out how to raise productivity. But it's also a question of politicians and leaders being prepared to take responsibility, not to kind of hand over responsibility to rules and say, these are rules and we'll meet those rules or we won't meet those rules. Uh, it's a question of taking responsibility for their actions, but the whole technocratic nature of the Eurozone, I would argue, is about evading responsibility. So ultimately, the solution is marginalising and get, getting rid of the Eurozone and the European Union and having some real democracy. Uh, and I suppose the starting point is to have debates like this, and not just in, in Australia, although I'm very glad to have them in Australia, but in Europe as well, to start debating fundamentally what the problems are with the Eurozone. That's probably the first step in moving towards a better future for Europeans. And are they? Are they? Uh, only to a very limited extent, I think. Not nearly enough. No, there's not enough debate, unfortunately. Amazing. Well, uh, we'll have to put our video online and tell all your friends. <laughs> I think that's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've heard two excellent presentations about an issue that, uh, as I've said, we've been dealing with at CIS for a while now. In fact, uh, uh, Oliver's actually working on a paper which hopefully will come out before too long about the implications for Australia and perhaps more broadly in this part of the world because it's, it's uh, maybe, the, maybe the conditions may, may not be as dramatic as, as you say, but uh, certainly there will be something and we have to be aware of it. We also have to be aware, we didn't even talk about demographic issues, we didn't even talk about the failure of welfare state and all the entitlement programs that they will have to deal with at some point. The important thing for us, or one of the important things for us in this country, is to not get ourselves in the same pickle. And uh, unfortunately, the way the political culture is going at the moment, there are pickles everywhere. So yeah. uh, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully some lessons will be learnt from um, what's happening elsewhere and then we can speak loudly about them. So on behalf of uh, you all let me, uh, would you please join with me and thank both Oliver and <laughs>